Well, hello everybody, we're back with part two of our Sansui 9090 restoration video. And let me tell you, it is cold today. I woke up to frozen pipes, um, which weren't too bad. I was able to thaw them out with a hair dryer. So thanks to my wife and daughter loaning me hair, a hair dryer. But I woke up and it was without the wind chill factor negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit unbelievable um, it's still below zero right now outside but uh, nice and warm here in the shop so here's where we are right now I've begun the uh, recapping and restoration of the receiver and so far we have this power supply board done and as you can see all the new capacitors are in I also replaced these three power transistors um, what tends to happen on these, and these are actually heavier duty ones than what was in here. Uh, the other thing was this ZD01, which is a 13 volt Zener diode. Uh, it was off by about 3 volts, and that's not uncommon. I've actually seen these drift before. They, the voltage will start to either drift up or down. Um, so I put a brand new diode in there. That brought the voltage perfect where it needs to be. Uh, I was kind of surprised that this thing has like a two-piece heat sink on this NPN TO220 voltage regulator, uh, the transistor here in the voltage regulator circuit. I was kind of surprised to find that there was absolutely no heat sink compound on that from the factory. So I, while I was in there, I went and took care of that. As you can see, we moved our capacitors up to the top. And... Uh, Pleased to say, after a good test, this is working very well. Uh, so we're pretty much done with this board. I still have to switch these out. As you can see, these are uh, supposed to be 6 amp. And I believe, I'll have to look it up. I know there's a document out there. But I'm pretty sure they, Sansui, after you do all these mods, they want you to change these out for a 10 amp uh, fuses. So uh, I'll take a look at that and let you know what I, what I find. Uh, we've also moved on to the driver board here. And uh, let me get it out where we can look at it a little bit. Hold on. So as you can see, um, remember from the last video, we did the uh, fuses and the resistor upgrades and replaced these. Uh, now I've gone and recapped it. Uh, there are a couple more things I need to do to this board. It's working fine right now as is. It's working very well. But uh, I wanted to replace these 1K and 4.7K uh, potentiometers, these little pot, trimmer pots, with uh, either better single turn or ultimately a multi-turn pot. Unfortunately, I didn't really have any in stock that would fit in here properly. I mean, I could have kind of kludged them in there a little bit, but I, I really didn't want to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and order some replacements. If they come in in a reasonable amount of time, I'm going to put those in. Uh, the other thing is, I'm going to show you something here. Take a look at these, these little uh, transistors in here. Do you see how the leads are the same color as the case? They're jet black. Now, if I go in here and... Uh, just kind of let's see if I can do this through the camera kind of scrape them just a little bit you see that come on focus there you go you can see how that stuff will come off and what that is is a it's a tarnish that these a lot of these little transistors from the 1970s have in common is that they'll get this tarnish and in, it's not always but some of them the tarnish will eat all the way through the leads other times the tarnish will actually kind of climb up. I call it a creeping doom. <laughs> They'll actually, that tarnish will climb right up and go into the case and it will actually mess up where that, where the actual lead makes the junction to the transistor itself inside the case and it will, they'll actually get noisy. Now these transistors that I can see right now, they don't seem to be noisy uh, as they are right now. But I spoke to the owner, and he really doesn't want to have to revisit this down the road. So we're going to have to replace these. Now, 
that leads to some problems guys I don't know uh, for some of you who do restorations out there um, and work on these things pretty regularly there's a little bit of a uh, a drought on the trans on these types of transistors these are right now uh, 2SC1708 2SC1708 they're kind of special as far as transistors are concerned and the reason the reason I say that is that um, they're very high gain and they're low noise uh, their pin configuration is a little bit different it's very very hard to find an exact replacement for these that that will work now I have in the past used uh, 2N 5551's and a couple other types with success but with the one caveat that you have to really match them you have to hand pick them find the ones with the highest gain make sure they're totally matched it's a it's a big process to just find some that work or you can replace there is a modern replacement by uh, on semiconductor on semiconductor they they're sold through Mauser and through DigiKey and they're a KSC uh, what am I thinking KSC 18 wait a minute let me look it up so I don't give you the wrong number okay I just had to look it up and make sure it's a KSC 1845 1845 and uh, those ones are suitable replacements but they are currently out of stock uh, and have been now for over a month at DigiKey and at uh, Mausers now I've used them they work good uh, I ran out of stock uh, they're very inexpensive so you can order a hundred or two hundred at a time I literally put three hundred of them on order and I think it cost me all of about fifteen or twenty dollars for all of them so it's not very expensive but I would recommend stocking up on these now because I'm getting the, the impression that they're gonna quit making them or go into limited production if they haven't already and uh, really there's not a whole lot of other good replacements there are some uh, but any of the ones that are suitable replacements for this seem to be getting harder to get um, again so I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to replace these or not while this is still here on the bench but uh, or if I can find some other ones here I have a lot of things in stock but I'll just have to go through what I got the other thing I'd like to do probably is these are uh, a differential pair and if you look at them in the schematics uh, they're right here you can kind of see how they're put together and these need to be very very closely matched they they're at the very front end so you could see this is the input to the to the amplifier so this is your first kind of stage of gain and they need to be perfectly matched they need to have high gain if if everything's not right it either it w won't work at all or it won't work correctly so like I said once again um, the other thing is if you remember from my uh, pioneer one of the pioneers I think it was a uh, SX 750 that I did a video on they were for a while making these in a package with like two transistors in one package for thermal reasons so that they track thermally together and um, that's still not a bad idea and if you remember I couldn't find a good one a good replacement so I used two discrete ones and they worked fine in that example there but what I may do is I have some heat sink adhesive it's kind of like heat sink grease except it's an adhesive as well it's a thermal adhesive and what I'm probably going to do when I change these out or if I change them out is I'll put a little dab of that thermal adhesive between them and then put a little piece of heat shrink around them to secure them together you know kinda like that and hopefully that'll give them a little bit more thermal stability too um, but once again uh, unfortunately until I find the ones that I'm happy with and that test out good 
Uh, I'm just going to leave these ones alone for now. I can continue on with the, re the rest of the restoration. Another thing you'll see is I put a couple of uh, 1N4148s, two of them, in series in place of that those little uh, little single one little spherical diodes that were in here um, those sometimes will go bad so I just kinda once again for preventative reasons I put these in they work perfectly like this and I just kinda tie them together at the at their junction and then kinda make it look like this put a little piece of heat shrink clear heat shrink over them so you could see them and uh, it works pretty good so Again, I haven't done any kind of crazy biasing or done any kind of alignment like that yet. Just did a quick test uh, running a 100 millivolt RMS into the input of the amplifier itself. I disconnected the jumper between the preamp out and the amp in and tested it working perfectly. So uh, we're going to kind of continue on from here and move on with the recap to the rest of it. So all these other resistors, everything else tested out good. Uh, these big transistors, they're fine and I typically don't change those unless I really need to. These ones don't seem to run very hot, uh, as hot as others have in the past. So uh, and some other amplifiers. So we're going to leave these alone. What I, I will probably redo the thermal compound on them. They do have a little bit but uh, I'll probably clean that up a little bit and this thing should be ready to go other than, like I said, the pots and the uh, extra transistors. So let's move on. Um, I'm going to move on over to the board over here. As you can see there's just a few capacitors in there. Um, you have your input selector switch on there. A few things that need cleaned up so I'm going to get started on that and uh, we'll be back. All right. Hold on a second. Get my microphone on here, huh? So I said I was going to do the caps on the selector switchboard, but in order to do the selector board, I had to take the front panel off to get the knobs out, to get the shaft out, and all that. So I thought while I was in here, I'd do the part that's my least favorite thing <laughs> now to get it out of the way, and that is to replace the panel lamps on this. I'm doing an upgrade to LEDs. Now, down inside here, uh, most of you know, you take these two screws, there's one here and one here, that you take off, and this little shield comes off, and there's four little fuse sockets, they just look like fuse sockets, that hold these little incandescent light bulbs. They look like a fuse, but they're actually little light bulbs. And you can go on eBay, and there are sellers who make a uh, LED replacement. And yes, these will run on AC voltage as well as DC. And they don't really flicker either, so they're really cool how they work. Now these ones are in cool blue. You can get them in different colors. Uh, I try to keep them in cool blue and warm white. Uh, the cool blue actually helps with the blue dials on like the older Pioneer and the Marantz and the Sansui's. So uh, very easy, you just pop them out, pop the new ones in. Same thing with the tuner meters. Now when we get to the power meters, that's the dreaded one to do. As you can see the power meters are kind of mounted way down in here. and they're not much fun to get out and they're even less fun to replace the bulbs. Now I did one already and I'll turn this on real quick and kind of show you what they look like. Um, let me shut some background lighting off. And if you turn it on, one of them has incandescence and the other one has LEDs and uh, I don't know, can you tell which one's which? Because I, I did one and I'm going to show you how to do these on the other one. So if I tip this up a little bit you can see a little better. Um, let me turn off the lights. So you can see one of them's LED and one of them's incandescent. So let's take a look. So if you guess the one on the right 
was the LED, you would have been correct. And as you can see, you can actually fit a standard five millimeter uh, diffused, I'll show you one here, five millimeter diffused warm white LED. You could also put uh, bright white, whatever color you want, really. Um, I like the warm white because they have that yellowish glow to them. But this is what they look like. Focus, you fine camera. There it is. And they fit, believe it or not, without having to modify anything. Here's your old little grain of wheat bulb that they have in there. They're called grain of wheat bulbs because they about the size of a grain of wheat. And they have this little rubber stopper on them that they mount through. And it just so happens that that little rubber stopper is five millimeters in diameter, just like this bulb. So it's actually a pretty perfect fit. Now, these bulbs will last a very, very long time. Matter of fact, that they'll probably outlast the receiver. And the way I do it is each LED has a 220 ohm resistor. And you can just use one of these little tiny I think these are actually rated at like one watt, but they're actually about the size of a quarter watt resistor. They're a little metal film, but they're very tiny. And I put those in series with each bulb, one, because there's eh, about seven or eight volts on there, roughly. And uh, it's that simple. Now, I'll go through the process on this one of how I do it. and. Like I said, this is a really kind of touchy job. It's very easy to break something, so you have to be extraordinarily careful. When you take this out, there's only two screws that pulls the whole meter panel out. And it swings forward just enough to get in there and work. But you have to have a little soldering iron, and you have to have tiny little needle nose pliers and things like that to work. But it is possible to do this without disconnecting everything. So that makes it a lot easier. You just have to be very careful. So let's go through the process here. All right, I hope, hope I have everything in shot here, in frame. So the first thing we want to do is we want to remove the old bulbs, get them out of the way. And to do that, if you look here, you have a couple of little terminals back here that these things solder onto. One here and one here, one here and one here. And the easiest way I found to get them out is just kind of grab a hold of a wire, the little pair of needle nose, get your iron, and just kind of touch it and just pull it out. And that's about it. And you grab the other one, same thing. You have to watch because you're, you're very close to a lot of wires. It's very easy to melt the coating on these wires. So you want to make sure you're very careful. Um, again, doing this at your own risk. Guys, if you ruin this, it's not my fault. <laughs> so, so you pop that one out. And then we come over here and we pop this one out. Now that we have that out, you just kind of grab these and kind of rock them out and they should come out. Sometimes these little rubber stoppers will get stuck in there. But that's all there is to it. They're out. Now the next thing you want to do is you want to clean up the the pads where you took these out of because the solder is still on there. And this is by far the hardest part of the job because you kind of need five hands to do it. <laughs> But uh, we'll see if we can do it. We got the other one done pretty good. Let's see how this one goes. So we're just going to go in here very carefully and just kind of clean that off. And when there's no wire in there, these are a lot easier to clean off. Uh, the solder wick works much better. So that's all there is to that. It's cleaned up. And uh, so let me do the other ones off camera here and get them done, and I'll be right back. Okay, I have the terminals cleaned off, and I have one of the LEDs put in. And I'm going to put the other one in here for you. And the first thing you want to look at is, if you look at the LED, there is a long lead and a short lead. The long lead, obviously, 
is the positive and the short lead is the negative. The short lead always goes to the uh, to the flat spot here which is the anode I believe and so you want to make sure or the cathode I'm sorry the flat flat is the cathode um, this is the anode but anyways you want to make sure and here's here's a tip for you when you put these in you want to put one side and it doesn't matter which sides which one side make the the long lead face outward like this towards you and on the other side make the short lead face towards you so they're opposite now there, there's a reason why we're going to do this what we're going to do is we're going to wire these two LEDs out of phase there's AC voltage going across here so these are only since they're diodes they're only going to light up on one half of the cycle on the, the positive going cycle the negative going cycle they're going to block and not conduct and not light up if you have them both wired in phase you may be able to see a little tiny bit of flicker in the lights because they're only running half on half wave if you put them out of phase um, what's going to happen is one of them's going to light up in when the phase is in one direction the other one's going to light up when on the other phase so basically they're going to the flicker will cancel each other out I don't know if that makes sense to you or not but that's what we're going to do so by by wiring them back to back like that it should cancel out any type of flicker so that's that's kind of what I'm doing there and I'll, I could draw that out for you here we'll show you what's going on okay so essentially what I'm talking about is wiring the diodes like this okay so these are obviously <laughs> your uh, light emitting diodes so during the positive going cycle half cycle of your AC waveform this is positive and this is negative right and so we have that path through this diode and back right and so this diode will light up of course this one's backwards biased so it will not light up conversely when we go opposite and this becomes plus and this becomes minus current will flow through this diode it will light up and go this way right and this one will block so no matter which half cycle you're on one of these will always be lit up and therefore it will minimize the flickering of the bulb so that's all we're doing by making one lead uh, just the way this little circuit board is wired by making one lead flipped around opposite of the other we're going to essentially be wiring this thing that way also be careful of this board it's only held on with a little piece of double stick tape and the little solder leads to the meter and you can very easily break them so it will flex a little bit but don't let it go too far again you're doing this at your own risk um, <laughs> if, if you're not careful you can damage things and I'm sure these meters are not easy to come by if you can find them at all so as you can see I have this one I have the short lead facing towards me so in this side I'm going to have the long lead facing towards me so we're just going to take this and kind of put it in here Whoop. and it's okay if they bend a little bit it won't hurt anything because we're going to be bending them anyways and you just pop it in there right like that okay next step we're going to take these little resistors and we're just going to push them up through this hole this first hole the closest one to us just like that okay and I'm going to do the same on the other side so you can see it's wired just like that and we're going to just tack that down with a little bit of solder I'm trying to work around the camera and this is not very easy to do without. OK. 
Okay, I'm going to have to move the camera to do this, but I'll solder it on here, and then I'll be right back. Okay, next thing you want to do is you just want to take these leads of these resistors after you solder them through there, pass them around the outside lead that's closest to you on both sides, hook, make the little J hooks, and just tack solder them down just like that. Now the next thing you're going to want to do is bend these ones over and put them in the remaining hole on either side. And I'll show you that here in a second. And you can see these are just the other lead is just bent around that way like that. And then you solder them in from the top. <clears throat> and that's it. That pretty much is a permanent fix for this. And let's see how it works. Move my light out of the way. Back this up a little bit. And let me put one little screw in here to hold it so that it doesn't keep falling out on us. And we can see how it looks. Okay. Let's try it out. What do you think? We're going to make smoke or light or both. Hey, how about that? And you can see, I don't know, I'm looking at this at the uh, viewfinder on the camera, uh, the little view screen, and I don't see any flicker whatsoever, so that's a good thing. So there you go. Um, we now have nice warm white panel lamps on the power meters here, and we have nice blue power lights there, or uh, back background lights on the dial. Now, one other thing we're going to do is we're probably going to replace these little little bulbs here. Let me go down. And we'll probably replace those with these little LED replacements. And you can see they should just fit right in there as well. And then once again, that'll be a permanent fix. We'll never have to deal with that again. So there you go. That's the LED upgrade for the Sansui 9090. So we're back into the recapping, and uh, I get this question over and over and over and over again, and that is when you're replacing capacitors, when do you want to replace uh, an electrolytic with a film cap? Well, anything that's in the audio path that your actual audio signal is going to pass through will benefit from using a film, you know, a high-end film capacitor, a modern one, over a electrolytic. Now, these little orange electrolytics, some people say that they're super high quality. You see how they're kind of sealed on the bottom? And you see these in a lot of the old gear, you know, this Sansui's, there was a lot of these in the Pioneers. Um, these are were considered audio grade electrolytics in their day. But I have proven again and again that these things do leak and they do go bad. Now, whenever you see these orange caps, those are typically in this older 1970s gear. Don't just go by the color, but I'm just kind of making a little bit of a generalization with these old 70s receivers. These are usually audio grade electrolytics. <clears throat> and anytime I see these, if I can, if they're available, and if the size and the space will permit, I will replace them with these. Now there's two different kinds I use. One is by WIMA, W-I-M-A, and you can see here they are. Here's one of them. These are very good capacitors. And the other ones are Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, and they're they're in a they look very similar to this only they're in a white package instead of a red package either one works just as good as the other they both I've had really good experience with them um, you don't have to worry about leakage or ESR or anything when you're dealing with a film capacitor over a electrolytic they there's nothing to dry out or to go bad in them they pretty much will last as long as the receiver lasts so this is a permanent fix uh, if anything, it's going to improve the, the performance of the receiver when it's in the audio path. Now, I don't really believe that there's a big benefit putting these in non-audio path 
places where you're just filtering something. They're very expensive compared to these. This is going to cost probably two or three times more than one of these would cost to replace. So it is going to be a price jump. So I use them sparingly, but I do use them in the audio path whenever and wherever I can. And I try to stick with electrolytics in anything that's doing a filtering type job, like in a power supply or something like that. So I hope that helps answer that question a little bit. All right, let's get back on with the recapping. All right, so I've got the 2541 board all finished up. It's recapped and cleaned up. I've cleaned the controls, checked all the solder joints and all that. Everything looks good. And I've moved on now to the 2547 relay speaker protect board. Now this board has your speaker selector switch on it which of course you need to clean that and uh, has a few capacitors it basically has your protect circuit on it and you can see this is where the protect relay resides and it's a four pole relay you can still buy these and they are available many places but I got mine through Mauser so you can see I keep I try to keep one in stock I have a couple different kinds that I keep in stock there's your part number and uh, here's the old one that came out and remember this is the original one it's over you know almost 40 years old now and if you take it apart I'll give you a little example I'll see if how well I can get it to focus but if you look there's your contacts okay and when you when you look at them, I don't know if it shows up on the camera or not, but you can see where the actual coating on there, you know we talked about co the coating that there's plated contacts and solid contacts. This one has plated contacts and you can see the plating is starting to wear off and when it does, even if you clean this, it will just tarnish again. So when they start to get like that, it's time to just go ahead and, and replace it. Um, now, if you look down at this one, I'll see if I can zoom you in a little bit. Right there. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look inside there, do you see how shiny those are? That coating in there? And you can see they're very, very shiny because they have the plating on them still. So, again, if you can, if you could find one and, and you're doing a restoration on these, it's probably a good, good thing just to, when they're this old and original. This doesn't have any real signs of arcing or anything on it, which is a good sign. Uh, the other thing, uh, as I mentioned in another, in my question and answer Q&A video, try not to turn this, turn this receiver on with the volume turned up especially with the volume turned up very loud because obviously what you're going to do is you're going to have all that power uh, coming out of the speaker terminals and they go right through this relay and straight out to your speaker which the speaker is actually a relatively low impedance load especially at static DC there's it's it's going to draw a lot of current and again this can hold the speaker current very well but when you're making and breaking that current this is not a contactor it's a relay it's really not designed to switch very high current for any length of time so if you turn the, the volume down on your receiver you know that's it'll probably help the relay last a little bit longer um, at least that's kind of how I see it what I think um, so we have the caps in on this one so this is about ready to go back together and I'm just going to kind of work my way through the rest of this and finish the recap and then uh, when I do I'll be back. Well it's been about a week uh, since the last video clip here and uh, I have almost all of the recapping done and uh, it's I've been very busy with work we have had some installs out of town a bunch of things but uh, on and off whenever I get an hour I come down here and do a little bit at a time 
and I finally got just about all of it done and I can tell you this was one of the most difficult recaps I've done on a receiver. Uh, in order to do the tuner board all of these three boards here have to come out and kind of get swung out of the way and then you have all these wires. These main capacitors had to be removed and the new ones that I'm fitting in there are a little bit smaller in size so I had to replace these brackets which required drilling two different holes here to just bring it in just a little bit so the new brackets fit properly. We'll get a little more into the details on this here maybe in another video because I want to kind of address a couple comments I had on these. But they're fitted. Uh, as you can see I got all the caps in on all the boards. Um, any of the really main audio path ones I tried to replace with film capacitors wherever I could and then this is going to get of course cleaned all of the controls and you know million little little tiny <laughs> things that need to be done so I'm getting ready to put this together here I'm going to finish up a couple things here we're going to flip this over take a look at it and uh, then do some more testing on it so we'll be back when we go to do that but I just kind of wanted to catch you up uh, with where I was right now all right, I got the main filters put back in, as you can see. And uh, <clears throat> there's a little change you may want to make when you go to replace these. Um, down in here where you have the two grounds, in the old one you had that little piece of braid, which is like this stuff here that goes between, and then the, the ground wire connected between those and went down to this little stud. but if you look at how this is, this little metal piece is kind of sandwiched between, you know, the circuit board is actually sandwiched between this metal tab and the chassis, and that's how the chassis gets its ground. Unfortunately, all of the grounding for the chassis then goes through this little tiny, right here, this tiny little screw. And as soon as the screw loosens up, uh, you, your ground is compromised. So one of the fixes you can do on this is the wire that was in that braid in between here I took that and I just tacked it right on here which is the ground trace on the board then I took another wire and I ran it to an actual physical lug that's tied to the chassis and this is a stainless steel screw um, and it's very tightly bonded to the chassis and then I went and tied my common points together on the capacitors and in that way it just kind of makes sure that you if, if that little screw ever comes loose you still have a good path to ground um, from the capacitors so everything's hooked up on this side as again as I was saying I'm gonna flip this around I got a couple more little things to do on the top and we're ready to uh, give it a, another little test Everything's all put back together now, and as you can see, I added some new uh, pots on there that are going to be a little easier to adjust. They're still single turns, but they're a lot smoother than the old ones. Um, I didn't have any multi-turns that would fit in there properly and line up and so forth, so I went with those. Um, I put a little bit bigger heat sink on this power supply over here, and I put an actual jumper. Again, poor connection, so I fixed that, recapped it. So this little power supply, this transistor is kind of known to be to run relatively hot. So the bigger heat sink and heat sink compound will really make a difference. The tuner, along with all the boards, are completely recapped. And that tuner was a real bear to do, uh, as you can see, you know, reaching around all that. But we got it all done. So uh, let's turn it on and see what we get. All right, that's good so far. And let's uh, go over to here with my loud family. And uh, <laughs> let's turn on some, okay, and align the phase. And you can see pretty close, and it looks pretty clean right now. And I'm, I'm not driving it real hard, and we're just going into the power amp in just to test it for right now. Everything looks good, so I think we can move on and I think we're ready to start the alignment. 
Well, we're going to end this video right here and uh, get it posted. It's probably awful long as it is. So the next thing we're going to do is, uh, next video, we're going to actually get into the alignment. Now I did test the tuner when I first brought this in, and it's a little bit out of alignment, so we're going to have to do that. And then obviously we're going to have to do the bias and offset and uh, go through it all and test it. So that'll be the last video. Uh, until then, thank you for uh, following along on this, and I thank you all for your patience. It took me a while to get this one put together because of uh, all the things in my busy schedule. And uh, so we're going to close, close up shop, and again, I'm going to wish you all the best of health, peace, joy, and happiness in your lives, and I hope all is well. Uh, stay warm if uh, you're in any part of the world here that's getting all this crazy cold weather. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye.